One thing about Thai that we do, as you know, uh, how many people are new to Thai for the first time who are here tonight? Wonderful, about 10 of us. Okay. One, so, the Thai, you know, very, you know, just very short history, Thai was created, you know, by entrepreneurs, for entrepreneurs, right here in Silicon Valley, 19 years ago. And uh, the, the sole mission was to promote and foster entrepreneurship, and we have not deviated from that one mission at all. And uh, over the years we have grown, and now we are into uh, 13 countries, uh, 57 cities. But this is the founding, this is the mother chapter, and this is the largest chapter in our Thai network. And uh, so no matter where you are, the Thai has three constituencies. And the first and foremost is what we call our charter members. These are the successful entrepreneurs, business executives, professionals, as well as folks from academia who are at a point in their life that they genuinely want to help others succeed in, in business, in entrepreneurship, and in the profession. So that's our core constituency. There are 300 such people here in Silicon Valley. If you look up, go to our website, you'll see the who is who belong to Thai. And globally, we have about 2,000 such people. So that, that's a very, very uh, strong asset we got. So that formed the core of Thai. And then around that are all the entrepreneurs, you know, whether they want to be entrepreneurs or they're already entrepreneurs and they need, they need more help and more advice. So they get attracted to the successful people. And then on the outer periphery is all our what we call the sponsors and other people who kind of want to know or join and kind of hang out with this combo of successful entrepreneurs as well as the aspiring entrepreneurs. So that's our, uh, um, our core uh, constituency. And actually I want to recognize the charter members uh, first and foremost because we all actually have Naveen Bist, he's the host for tonight, and Naveen is a charter member and a board member. Naveen, thank you very much. Um, then we got Murli Rangarajan. Murli, where are you? There you Murli. Murli is a long time charter member and he also is a director of Thai Institute and Thai board member. And all the other charter members, if you can just only raise your hands, that will be great, okay? So look at just look around. Okay, there are quite quite uh, quite a good many of you. Thank you very much for your continued contribution. Then we also have uh, some of our sponsors. I see in the room. I see Stan is here. Stan, uh, Stan is from Morgan Stanley, and uh, he's been um, a big supporter and helper. Any other sponsor in the room that I can uh, recognize? IBM. Oh, IBM. Oh, there you go. You're hiding in the back. Yeah, IBM. IBM is what is 100 year old company in this week, right, or uh, this month? Yeah. Uh, IBM is a long, long time a sponsor of ours. So anyway, the one thing that we do, is so that I just want you guys to know, every program that we run Thai, it has only five elements to it, okay? The program is supposed to inspire you, inform you, educate you, prepare you for a venture, and now we have launched a new program. Also, if your venture is worthy, we can also, through Thai Angels, we can also give you some seed funding to put you on the first rung of what I call success ladder. And the Thai Angels, our, one of the newest programs, has been hugely successful. And those of you, if you are aspiring entrepreneurs and looking for some seed capital, go to Thai Angels, uh, you know, the Thai Silicon Valley website and Thai Angels, and uh, that's, that's a good one. Now, we tee up all the programs into various sectors, but again, um, the industry-wide, only five things are very important to us these days, and you saw them during TaiCon. Uh, social is a big category, mobile is a big category, Energy is a big category, cloud is a big category, and life science is a big category. So everything that we do, you know, where the entrepreneur want to learn more about what's going on in those sectors, so we do a lot of that. Then we also have programs, you know, around, uh, you know, uh, soft skills, and the Thai Institute does a very good job teaching how-tos about how to start your business, how to build your business, how to grow your business, and how to exit. And then we got other programs around forums and stuff like that. So go and look at the Thai website, everything you described, I don't need to really say much. One other thing that you should know, we bring thousands of people every year through our programs. So if you take a look at the last three years, and including TaiCon, so we have 25,000 people have come and benefited from Thai programs. So this is really huge. There is no such thing like that anywhere. And the other good thing about Thai is that we are an individual-based organization. We are not a trade association. We are not an industry body. We are purely, we believe, in unleashing the, 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 the potential of the individuals who can go on and build successful businesses and create jobs and opportunities. So this is what Thai is all about. So please uh, spread the word to your friends and everybody else. And uh, with just that, uh, I just, you know, we got some other upcoming programs. I just want you guys to uh, make a note. We have one thing on energy, that's on 21st of June. Uh, very interesting program. We have another program on June 23rd. It's called Growth Company Forum. 
Uh, this is where you know entrepreneurs came to Thai, get they got inspired and they got informed and they started a company and now in the growth stage and what do you do? So this is the program we launched about three years ago and it's been pretty successful. So this is uh, so I would recommend that you should, you guys should come and attend that. And with that, I'm just going to invite our host for this evening, and that's Mr. Naveen Bisht. This was his brainchild to come up with this program called My Story, and uh, let him tell you more about it and introduce our um, our um, um, uh, prominent uh, uh, featured uh, gentleman for this evening. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Chris. Okay, um, so how many of you have a 10-year-old kid at home? <laughs> let me see some hands. Okay, well, we might have a number of startups in making in few years. So imagine you get your inspiration from your 10-year-old kid for the next big idea or the next company you want to start, and you're really excited about it. So what do you do? And you believe in it so much that you feel it's a game-changing idea. You start approaching, obviously, Central Road VCs, and guess what? You get rejected by 50 venture capital firms. However, you believe in that idea so much, and you really believe that it's a game-changing idea, you persist and you keep on charging ahead. And what do you do? You create that idea and, and turn it into a successful, into a market leader within three years in a crowded market of payments industry by revolutionizing the new, new digital good payment model. And not only that, then you successfully sell this to one of the largest payment transactions company for $190 million within three years. So how do you accomplish such a great success in a tough market condition? If you remember, last three years have been really tough. So how do you do that? This is what Carl Mehta did with PlaySpan. Not only he created PlaySpan into a market leader within three years without any background in payments industry. So there is some hope for all of us. <laughs> and also successfully selling it to Visa for $190 million to extend Visa's capability into the fastest growing segments of e-commerce, uh, which is digital and mobile commerce. Today, PlaySpan is the global leader in monetization systems for over 1,000 online games, virtual worlds, and social networks. Placeman provides monetization as a service platform that allows merchants to monetize their content by using Placeman's technology in fraud and risk management, analytics, merchandising, and global payment connectivity. Merchants use Placeman technology to enable consumers, consumers to make safe and convenient purchases online for items such as game, uh, credits, uh, premium memberships, and digital goods. So without taking too much of thunder from Carl, let me invite Carl Mehta, founder and CEO of Placement, <coughs> to share his exciting, colorful, and amazing entrepreneurial journey with us tonight. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Chris. Uh, driving up, uh, driving down here from 
Foster said, hey, that uh, what am I going to share? Um, I haven't really, uh, not really given much thought, but I actually did the right thing by coming a little early and uh, tried to talk with some of the audience here to get some, uh, you know, just a feel of that. Why did people sign up? Because I, you know, I, I understand there's a fees uh, uh, to attend the session. So, um, and I have to do justice to that uh, uh, to get the value for the money. So, I think there's a couple of good questions that I, I heard from the audience. Uh, Jajit Singh, is that right? <laughs> had a, a wonderful question. I met this gentleman here outside, and uh, his question was that, uh, hey, how do you uh, create uh, a business or a startup in a space where there are 800, uh, where there is an 800 pound gorilla uh, companies out there? And, and wonderful question because you know this is the, the exact uh, type of questions that uh, VCs uh, kept on asking, and uh, that was kind of probably the number one objection uh, for saying no. Uh, to a business plan, I'm sure that a lot of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, face this exact same question because you know you generally go to an investor and the investors are always really scared of and worried about oh you know there's um, uh, whatever space you are in and uh, whoever are the top three leaders in generally any category and they're going to say you know how are you going to do it because there's all this you know three big companies they will easily extend it. So uh, I'll I'll try to address uh, some of those questions, but I thought that you know it might be useful to uh, kind of uh, talk about. In general, uh, the the two parts of um, the company uh, founding um, and the funding, which is the kind of the part one of the movie, and then the part two is uh, building and scaling the business. And I've gone through this uh, multiple times, having done uh, three or four different companies. And by the way, the, the most recent one, which uh, PlaySpan was a home run, uh, even though the announced deal was 190 million, but the total deal was about a quarter billion dollar, 250 million. So it was definitely a home run. But by the way, uh, prior to that, I had a number of failures. Uh, so uh, one moderate success, which was Mobilaria, the, the, the company prior to PlaySpan, and then prior to that, a uh, bunch of failures. So I think a lot of the uh, uh, lessons learned were actually more from the companies that have that I've done and have failed uh, rather than the companies that have been successful. Um, and uh, so you know, starting uh, from the the founding and the funding, and I'll definitely address uh, more of the PlaySpan story because that's more recent and more relevant. And um, I think also there were a number of questions from uh, some of you about. The whole founding thing, that you know, how do you come up with the idea, right? Because it was certainly a very crazy idea. So, uh, you know, in uh, 2000, and back in 2000, and late 2006, 2007, uh, there was no real, uh, you know, social gaming or no, not even Facebook API. So, you know, the whole uh, virtual economy or what, sh what people know now or what is mainstream today uh, was, was non-existent. And uh, there was one big game, which is, you know, I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of, which is World of Warcraft, and uh, has, uh, you know, pretty large-scale economy in terms of gold, right? You know, people, the gamers play there, and, you know, they're mining gold. And um, luckily, uh, I had a, you know, nine-year-old who uh, was an extreme gamer and, you know, plays a lot of these games. And we saw that, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a, there's a demand for the gold because you know that's how actually the game mechanics work. That you know you, you buy the currency in that virtual world and then you build up your character and that's how you you, you level up. And um, there was also enough demand for people not just buying it, but demand. Uh, but there were enough sellers who would somehow get to the gold uh, either by buying it or by uh, just mining the gold in the in the virtual uh, world. And uh, it was kind of a leap of faith uh, for me uh, to kind of. You know, think about it, and you know, uh, my son was saying that you know, Dad, this is really big, and you know, I need this gold, and I'll, I'll give out my credit card, um, and we'll see all this money going out, and then um, I think a few times we were actually able to make money because we were able to sell the gold. And I said, Wow, you know, that's pretty, that's, that's fascinating, that uh, you know, we were able to make money out of nothing because really, you know, you buy low and you, uh, you know, sell sell high, right? which is. Uh, very very simple business. Uh, so the question was that you know uh, whether this will scale in terms of will this become something big, and uh, what is really needed here. And uh, I think a lot of ideas came from uh, this uh, miners because you know when you see the whole demographics of the miners under 18, uh, they have a pretty large, uh, pretty big issue about how to use online payments, uh, which is credit cards by uh, by uh, regulations. You can't. Uh, issue for under 18, um, we were able to find, you know, we were able to see a lot of hurdles for uh, just in terms of security, in terms of authentication, a whole bunch of things. So it was really a very simple idea that, you know, why don't we build uh, 
some kind of a very simple marketplace right in the app. And uh, so that becomes really very simple for those users to, to buy and sell uh, you know, the, the, the currency. And uh, that led to actually a kind of a corollary idea, which was saying that, okay, but you can do the marketplace, but how are you gonna get the money from people? Uh, so you need, to, uh, you need to get the money, so you need to create some kind of a wallet. Uh, it's like a, like a locker, so you know, like, you know, the high school kids, they have lockers and stuff in the school. So very much like you need a locker uh, in this virtual world on the internet where you can keep your stuff uh, or keep the money and then use it from that locker rather than running back to the parents uh, you know, all the time for the credit card. So that was a very, very simple um, kind of an idea. It was very unproven, uh, totally unproven. Uh, and uh, obviously if it worked, then there are other big players who can easily uh, do it. Uh, it's a matter of if we can do it, then others can do it too. Because, you know, well, if, if I need 20 engineers to build this uh, piece of software, then I'm sure PayPal or Visas of the world have thousands and thousands of engineers. So. Um, so, and I think uh, that is kind of the uh, the dilemma that probably every entrepreneur goes through because you, know, if you work on an idea. Um, I'm sure that other people have thought of the same idea, and uh, if you can execute on it, someone else can also execute on it. So those are kind of the uh, you know the the hurdles, and uh, the way we kind of went around the hurdles. Uh, so so the number one uh, kind of lesson learned and from just from a war story standpoint was that you know we thought that you know. What we want to do is build something, and uh, let's not worry about you know how we're going to make money, uh, whether this is going to become successful or not. Uh, because anyway, when we were going out and telling people, nobody believed in it because most of the people don't even know about you know at that time three and a half years back that what the virtual economies are. So let's just do it as a as an experiment and you know build it, and uh, you know if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, so. That I think requires a lot of uh, courage uh, from the standpoint of you know hey a that uh, you have strong uh, belief and kind of leap of faith. Uh, B is that you are not kind of uh, the traditional thinking. You are actually uh, going against the the grain, so to say, which is you know you're not thinking in terms of traditional way how investors or VCs or typical business people think, but you're really focused on building something really cool, and then. Um, you know, thinking that, you know, if you build something really cool, and as long as people will like it, I think we'll be able to make a business out of it. So I think that is the, the mind shift, uh, the, the mindset that I think will really help, because if we would have tried to kind of uh, apply some kind of the, the, the traditional mindset around it, uh, we would have not gone any further. And uh, that kind of is reflected in uh, the point that, you know, we, uh, in the first one year, while we were building the solution, uh, we did our traditional uh, rounds to Sandal Road and pitched the idea uh, to almost like 50 VCs. And I think I'm probably the only company might have got rejected by 50 VCs because generally, if you get rejected by 25, that's enough. Like you will, <laughs> most people will give it up. Uh, it's not easy uh, because uh, you know think about it in 52 weeks, which means like you're almost meeting one VC form like every week, and you're pitching to them. Uh, there's a lot of preparation that is required before the meeting, trying to get the introduction, then getting in there, and there's a lot of you know follow-ups that is required after the <coughs> meeting, and all of those things are going completely nowhere. Right? Uh, the objection, the way to kind of uh, we did the the objection handling uh, in terms of you know the classic objection that you get from the VCs. And by the way, there's no way of uh, I know I'm sure there's some VCs here in the audience, and I'm not bashing any, any VCs, but uh, uh, I'm going to say that uh, you know you're gonna get some of these objections and uh, partly, so number one was, you know, when you, you pitch the idea about, you know, how big is the market and like obviously uh, they all focus on, you know, size of the market and the TAM and the SAM and the SOM and all of those stuff and my classic answer was that, you know, hey, if I knew all the numbers of TAM, SAM and SOM, then, you know, the opportunity to invest is already over because in any market you know, or in any category, if someone has a really crisp charts about the size of the market and the addressable market and all of that stuff, someone's already figured it out. So there is no opportunity to invest. The, uh, and then I got, you know, by the 25th time, you know, your ears are hurting because you get the same, the VC is asking the same question. And uh, I kind of got a little bit even um, rude by saying that, you know, well, that's a great question that you should answer because if you, want to, if you invited me, I'm sure you've done your homework and you should know the space. Because, uh, you know, uh, I'm hoping that, you know, you're smart enough that you've done some research in this space and know how big is the market, 
and that's why you invited me, otherwise you won't be taking your time, wasting your time. So why don't you tell me how big is the market? Let's not have an argument because in the first 25 meetings, there's uh, literally sometimes you have a lot of these junior guys um, in the VC, like you know the associates who are you know, like right out of the MBA school, and they will actually literally, like you, whatever, no matter what chart you throw in, they're going to argue with you that no, this is not like 5 billion, but it's 4.6 billion, all right? Oh like, what's the point? <laughs> like, hold on. And, you know, whether you, know, you got this number from Forrester or this number from Gartner, it's all complete BS. And uh, kept saying that, look, guys, you know, I don't know what the market is, uh, but, you know, I'm going by the gut, and, you know, you got to have, you know, a lot of these new businesses and new ideas get created based on gut feeling. And we have the gut feeling here that, you know, if there are 10 million people who are playing World of Warcraft and 10 million people are doing this, I think it is just a matter of, you know, an imagination, having some kind of a vision that if 10 million people, that's a critical mass. That's going to be 100 million people. There will be 90 million people that will do the exact same thing. It doesn't take more than that. It's like <coughs> common sense. So, uh, still, you know, uh, you, you don't get that kind of a common sense and a lot of, uh, you know, you know, venture firms are not going to uh, just go with that. So, that was, by the way, objection number one. And uh, the, the second objection, which was exactly what uh, Mr. Uh, Singh asked me about it, you know, hey, uh, how do you build a business, uh, you know, in a sector where there are all these 800 pound gorillas? And that was exactly the second objection. So, you know, we had some VCs or some investors who would like say, all right, fine, uh, you know, let's move on to the next room, which is, you know, okay, if you can do it, what's the big deal? There's no IP means here. Uh, you know, there's no, like, I mean, yeah, you can find a pattern here. It doesn't mean anything in, in a startup world. So, uh, you know, why can't PayPal do this? Why can't Visa do this? And, like, that was their great objection uh, for not funding, right? And uh, the way we work in that means, you know, my classic answer at that time was that, you know, hey, we have a better product. Simple as that. You know, before iPod, there are lots of MP3 players, you know? And uh, doesn't mean that you know it was a better product. So, and we have a better product, and we are going to run faster because the the whole idea about why small companies win against big companies is just one word it's summarized, and that's agility. Small companies are more agile, and they can run faster. And I think um, I'm I'm quite shocked at you know how much uh, in the investor community you still get this objection because generally anybody anybody who's been in the startup world and in the investment world or in the technology world uh, they should. By now, absolutely know that you know big companies can't move fast. It's period. So uh, you know that whole objection that you know when you have a new niche in the market and, and the startup is going after it and just saying that IBM will do this or you know Visa will do this or Mastercard will do this um, if they don't have a, a, a product or a technology a product in that particular sector, I think there is no way that I, that that whole. Um, you know, fear of, of large companies moving in and uh, executing faster than you uh, is complete BS. So that doesn't work. Uh, I think we've seen this for more than 20 or 30 years. Uh, I, don't, I can't recall of any example where a, a large company was able to beat a, a small company in a new sector and by just out innovating and out executing purely on speed, uh, speed to market. Right. So, so that was the um, second uh, you know, objection. The third objection was that you know, okay, if you've, uh, uh, you'll get the product out, you have, uh, you know, this large uh, competitors, they are not going to move in, but, uh, you know, this is not going to be a, a scalable business. It's going to be a kind of a lifestyle business. Maybe you'll be able to make some money, but this is not going to be a home run. And uh, because why would somebody, you know, ever buy you guys? Or, you know, would you ever even make it to a, big enough business that it's uh, it's an ipo -able business. So again, that requires, um, you know, uh, you need uh, investors or people who are willing to see the big picture and able to really imagine that, you know, how, how this market, and there's a lot of risk involved in that, there's a lot of market risks uh, involved in that and how it is going to evolve. And also it also, it depends on your ability to, um, you know, pivot your, your business and uh, and move into different uh, market segments so that you can become, bring uh, you know, build a large enough business. So one of the way of you know objection handling was that okay initially you know the pitch is that obviously we're building a platform this is a transaction platform for micropayments um, even though you know we may be focusing on the first vertical as gaming but we can certainly uh, scale the business into a lot of other verticals so anyway those were kind of the the initial uh, founding things that kind of the principles that we we, we really uh, applied and uh, constantly just continue to build build and build. Um, Ultimately, you know, when we had uh, enough traction going on, uh, 
the Series A was like super oversubscribed. I had to say no to a lot of visas, especially it was fun actually saying no to those people who said no to me before. Uh, that's, the, that's the best time, you know, because because those exact people, they, they all came back and said, oh, Carl, I heard, you know, he, let's chat again, let's meet for coffee, and, you know, I heard that you're doing a round, you're interested, and, okay, sorry. So, um, I think, so, it was keep building the traction. The other, um, I think I learned is that, I mean, I've done this in the previous startups too, that I think there's nothing beats uh, bootstrapping. So I think the more money that, uh, it actually helped me to invest my own money to keep the business going for uh, the first one year. But I think the more money that you invest of your own, I think it gives you the level of conviction in the business. Uh, it also makes you really strongly bonded. So I would not start a business just with other people's money. Uh, I would actually love to you know, put my own money and keep building it to a level where you take money only when you need money. Uh, for scaling, so I think that's one lesson learned. And even though, you know, uh, if that money, um, you know, putting your own money hurts, but I think uh, it's uh, it's worth it because um, you know that that pain is going to turn into pleasure. Um, so that's uh, more about you know the how we went into the founding and the funding, the the execution. I think which is uh, really building and scaling and that kind of the answers that okay, how do you still survive now and then. Uh, and then build the business in a, in a, in a computation, um, which is, you know, the transactions of the payment industry. I don't know uh, how much uh, you guys know about the background, but, you know, it does not been um, a lot of innovation. The only big innovation that happened was 10 years back, which is PayPal, uh, that came up with the the online payment wallet. But it's a 50-year-old industry. It's a very old boys, uh, you know, kind of club, you know, which was dominated by the, you know, the four big card network and um, it's very hard to break into uh, the payment industry because there are a lot of regulations. By the way, the regs in the payment industry are not by the, I means the government has a lot of regs. Uh, they come after you because the moment you're taking someone's money, uh, they can tell you that you're a bank and you're a deposit and you've got to tra have this transfer, this money transfer to law and this uh, licenses. Uh, it's unbelievably hard in, 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 especially US is actually way extreme uh, when it comes to regulations uh, compared to even other countries. But uh, even this whole card networks, they themselves have a regulation, so they act like a government. <laughs> this is a large company, the private company whom you're competing with, they have regulations. Like if you look at, uh, you know, Bascar or Visa, the, the regulation is like this thick book, right? So they'll tell you that, you know, you can't take payments of, you know, of this size, you have to charge this much interchange. Um, so everything is kind of built in a way that it favors kind of the, the old guards. So it's very hard for a new company to break into it. And, uh, you know, the way we did it is that, um, I think, really followed um, the, uh, the crossing the chasm, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the Jeff Moore uh, Bible for uh, market adoption, kind of almost word by word. So we stayed very focused on a niche. So we, we, we picked the niche, which was uh, you know, the, the online games at that time, but then also you know, the social networks as they were just starting to open up. And uh, staying like very focused on the niche, and we built the wallet uh, platform that was very, very specific to addressing all the pain points over there, which is A, uh, you know, high velocity transactions, but, you know, very small value transactions, and, you know, most of these guys can't do small value transactions, because, you know, if you do a one dollar transaction using your um, cards or even PayPal, it costs you 2% and 30 cents, which comes to almost like 34%, and, uh, you know, you just can't do that. And so we figured out a way at how to do that transactions uh, economically. Uh, so that was one major uh, kind of a pain point solved. The second big one was that, you know, most of the payments was kind of all out of the app and, uh, you know, out of the, it generally takes you to a checkout page. So the checkout experience we, we experienced that has not changed in the, in the e-commerce world for the past 20 years. But generally you hit the buy button, you go to a checkout page, you, it looks like kind of a dog's breakfast of a number of different buttons there, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, whatever. Uh, and you lose a lot of conversions uh, and traffic as you go through the whole process. And, you know, we, the way to make money um, for the digital goods or online payments is, Every, you know, the conversion rate is what it counts. How many people hit the buy button and how many people actually pay. So if you can increase the conversion rate by even like 1%, um, you know, you can increase the revenue by almost 25% because if your conversion rate is only 4%, a 1% increase can have a pretty massive impact on the revenue. So we picked one metric and we, we figured out that you know, as long as we are hitting on that one metric and, um, you know, the conversion, uh, we can get away with everything else because, you know, the merchants love it. And if I can show someone a 25% increase in the revenue just by, a, you know, much better uh, simplified user experience and, and a more integrated product, they're going to they're gonna go with us. So so we, we kind of really uh, nailed that and uh, really had a killer product uh, uh, doing that in terms of the in-app stuff. 
And then the third big, uh, big item was, you know, in the, in the digital goods as, as a massive one that came in, I'm sure you guys have got the numbers, but that's multi-billion dollar fraud that was on in, in the online payment industry. And the digital goods is a very high rate of fraud because, you know, digital goods is like, you know, like videos, you download videos, and uh, like the porn industry is a very high fraud, and people watch the porn video and say, I never watched it, so they do a charge back. So that's like, because in digital goods, there is no FedEx, uh, you know, tracking number, like physical goods. So in digital goods, people can buy all day long, you know, digital goods, and then they can say that, you know, we never bought the item or never used them and stuff. Uh, so we solved that problem by, you know, creating a very, very tight integration with the actual asset, uh, you know, the, uh, the digital asset that users are buying, you know, and uh, having the whole end-to-end -end, uh, tagging of the items uh, to kind of prove it that, uh, you know, we have a proof of the delivery and that reduced, uh, you know, the fraud dramatically. So those were kind of like really focusing on um, creating a, a user experience, UX and UI, um, and also solving uh, some of the really hard problems that these big companies can't solve, and, uh, and and build a product which was like very simple and easy to integrate and very simple and easy to use. Um, and then um, when we went out to even the large card networks, uh, they realized that you know they absolutely want us because if the a lot of the merchants which they were uh, rejecting it, if actually they use PlaySpan's platform, they are seeing higher revenue and reduce fraud. So um, we, we did get a lot of objections, we did get a lot of resistance initially, uh, both from the merchants, right, and also uh, the first time when I went out and we had something demoable to show to the, uh, you know, the first few merchants, uh, absolutely we got a, you know, a lot of rejection, you know, right there, say, <coughs> you know, we don't need this, there's a lot of work for integration, there's all kinds of um, reasons why you know, merchants don't want to buy this, there's all kinds of reasons why Visa, PayPal, all these companies, you know, the payment companies, they don't want to use this or adopt this new technology because they're worried that you know, we are disintermediating you know, the value chain because we are somehow you know, squeezing ourselves in this value chain uh, and making money on the front end and actually being you know, the first party uh, to their customer. So we are the, 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 you know, the, kind of the first uh, platform provider and here's their customer and then all the networks, all the payment networks in the world, they become kind of back end. So we rapidly integrated almost 85 different payment app methods worldwide and made all those payment methods as kind of the back end. So it's, it created a love-hate relationship because uh, you know, the love uh, is that you know, we are bringing them business, but the hate relationship is because we are disintermediating them and we are, you know, putting, switching, or we are pushing ourselves in the middle. But uh, I think um, that's uh, very, uh, very specific to uh, in our industry, but I'm sure uh, there's a lot of these this lessons learned over there that could be applied uh, uh, to various other industries, uh, which is you know really focusing on a particular niche. Uh, I think it's the classic, uh, all the entrepreneurial uh, principles, but I think uh, I'm, I'm telling you the story specifically how you know we applied it so that you kind of get a sense of you know how the same general principles, which do sound like cliches sometimes, but uh, they do have value and they do get actually applied. In Specific situation. So um, I think the uh, some of the the counterintuitive uh, decisions that we took, uh, you know, throughout uh, building the product, which is you know in the web 2.0 or in the consumer internet world, I am sure you might have heard the uh, the common advice which is being given out nowadays is that you know uh, launch fast and iterate fast. Right? Uh, we didn't follow that, uh, even though we were a consumer internet product. And uh, the reason is, and I, you know, very. Uh, uh, very uh, anxious to tell a lot of people that don't just blindly follow that that advice, because generally in a lot of product space uh, you have only one chance uh, to 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 present a great product, and if you don't have a really uh, good ex if you don't give a good experience the first time, most likely you know you may not get the second chance because people just go away uh, as consumers or <coughs> even in a B two B especially where we had a B two B two C B two B two C product you know, the business customers will, will go away. So we had a developmental philosophy, and it's a lot of uh, things that we did in the, from a culture standpoint in the company, which is that uh, we never had any um, project managers, any deadline, any plans. Uh, you know, even today, like we have 100, I have 150 people just in my group, uh, until we sold Visa, 140 engineers, and no project manager. So no project management, no timelines, um, no deadlines, and you know, the philosophy was that we are ready when we are ready. We are only going to ship and release things when we know that we are ready for it. So that way, uh, you know, engineers get 
enough time to polish the product. Uh, we're not just throwing something like you know, like a Gmail bank thing and have six years for beta. Uh, we can't afford to do that. Uh, no offense to Google here, but uh, we can't do that. Uh, you know, we, we realize that you know we're in an industry which is in a transaction industry, and when you're taking uh, money from a consumer. Uh, they're not going to like a sloppy product. Uh, you know, they're not going to be that tolerant with just because you put the word beta on your product. Uh, if you lose them, you're going to lose them. So uh, that was a very counterintuitive because you know it had a lot of pressure from the board or you know VCs and you know, traditional advices that everybody throws around, which is that you know hey this is web to and you know you got to have multiple releases and launch fast and you know iterate fast and fail fast and all that stuff. So that was one thing that. Uh, we never did that on the uh, on the developmental front. Uh, the customer front, again, that was a very we took a very different approach. Uh, so generally, when you're a startup, uh, you know, and I've gone through this before in the past, where you know you try to hang on to any branch that you can hang on to and take any customer that you get in the front door because you just want to build up your customer base and you know throw logos and all that stuff. Um, here we realized that you know the the fastest way. So that is the point around that you know we built this company in like three years and and got to the market leadership in our category because we are the, the, the largest platform provider in this category now. And the way we built it is that um, I realized that you know I can sign up uh, hundreds and hundreds of customers which are small and medium size, and um, you know they will use the product, they will generate some transaction volume, uh, but I can't <coughs> leverage them uh, to become a market leader because none of those names are going to be leveraging. So uh, I kind of followed a very reverse philosophy even though I had pressure uh, from the board that you know where's the revenue and you know as a customer uh, I said you know I'm gonna go after the largest customer in this category mm -hmm. because if I can win the Disney's of the world or the Facebook's of the world or you know uh, the Microsoft of the world the, the big brands just that one brand will be very very leverageable very very referenceable and then that will generate this kind of a you know the the whole uh, virtuous cycle and then I can use that one stepping stone to move to the next 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 and that plan actually really worked. Um, and, and obviously there are a lot of objections on the table where, you know, why would a large company buy from a small company? Uh, you want to build up first a lot of, you know, small company base, and then you want to go to the large company. And, uh, you know, uh, I was under, uh, there, was, there was also another factor in the way the product was evolving because we were in a, you know, more of a product evolution stage. Uh, we, we didn't have all the requirements because, by the way, we didn't even have any product, uh, product management. Uh, like specifically a product guy, and so, uh, you know, I had to bring in the business and the product guy, and then I had a great engineering VP of engineering who would build the stuff. So um, we um, we had to constantly evolve the product, and while you're evolving the product, okay, how are you gonna get a large customers to buy into it? Um, so you know that was a very very unusual and a very bold uh, strategy, and it could have failed, and we could have been just sitting there for two years and. Uh, there is also a risk that sometimes these large customers, you know, they can turn you into a very, very specific, you know, custom shop and actually suck you dry and, you know, drain you out all your resources and, you know, two years later, you know, you still have revenue, but, like, you're not growing. You're not, like, you're not a rocket ship going up. So uh, it was a, a very targeted and a very selective way of uh, building up, uh, you know, the market development and the product. And um, I think that really helped because I was very careful about you know not getting uh, too much caught up into you know just the cheap revenues or um, just feeling feeling good factor about okay I've got a lot of customers and things like that. I wanted something that is really a big enough problem and a big enough customer and if it solves for the top of the pyramid, you know for the big customer it will definitely address everyone else. The other thing is that in the transaction industry it's a lot of trust factor. Because you know uh, it's, it's a payment business. At the end of the day, I'm settling. I'm doing all the settlement of the money to the to the merchants, and so uh, I can build a lot of you know hundred thousand or hundred uh, different customers, uh, which are small customers. But I can I can stand on that customer base by showing that I'm trustworthy, because uh, you know it doesn't doesn't build your brand from a trust standpoint. So the the only way for a startup to build a trusted brand is that you is through association, because you know if other trusted brand is using and working with you, then by referenceability, you know, you are a trusted person. So that was one of the, the key, uh, especially in, a, in, a, in an industry like this, in a, in a transaction industry where a lot of uh, success depends on the ability to build a trusted brand. So that really, it, it took us a longer time to latch on to or, or find and integrate to the first large customer, but, um, you know, and we did a, a lot of special things for them and we learned a lot. 
but we actually use that first customer as uh, you know also our product management, also our QA. So it was like uh, an unbelievable, <coughs> and I think it's worth you, you doing some kind of a really crazy deal uh, for that first customer. But it helps you to really build a strong foundation for the company. So uh, so that was on the um, on the market development side. Again, a very very unique and a very different approach, and uh, something that was not uh, supported by a lot of consensus driven. The third thing is, you know, the execution. And execution, I, I think, is uh, was totally driven by one and one thing, which is culture. I think very critical how you build the culture in the company because the culture drives the execution. Right? And um, so the, the culture in the company uh, from the very beginning was that, okay, we we're going to be very, very focused on quality. We're not going to take any shortcuts. We're not going to go on a fast path. Uh, we're not going to get just, you know, sucked into revenue, revenue, revenue. We want to build a great product. We want to have the first few customers who are like super duper referenceable, and they said nothing but great about us. And uh, so that that culture of, of execution is very different from a large company culture because again, in a large company, you know, people most of the new initiatives, the way I've worked at big companies too, and it's like you know, it all starts with okay, how we're going to this new market and how much new revenue we're going to create, and uh, there is a lot of pressure around it. And, even as a startup, you have a lot, in fact, you have more pressure because you're running out of money. You don't know that whether you have money to pay the bills uh, or, or the, the payroll for next month. But I think not uh, uh, not giving in to all that short-term uh, pressures and you know staying out of the temptation of the short-term successes and um, and you know revenue or whatever it is, uh, I think that, that really helps to build kind of the character uh, and, and the culture in the team. And the team then feels like you know, they're not like pressured and it's not a pressure cooker because, you know, we are uh, recognized that, you know, we are in an industry which is has more jobs than uh, talent available in the space, right? Uh, it's so hard to get uh, good talent in, uh, in Silicon Valley, especially in this market uh, for, for software and, and things that we do. And so the only way to attract and retain and get the best out of the, the talent and, and build an execution culture is uh, to be very careful about not building the pressure cooker. And, you know, a lot of companies that we hear, you know, they're doing great, you know, the Zingas of the world, but then we also hear from the people who come and interview with us and they say, okay, why are you leaving? There's a free IPO of me. And they say, you know, I'm like, you're getting killed there. It's, it's a pressure cooker. Right? So um, building that kind of a culture, <coughs> at some point the employees actually then they start, they're loving it and they would never leave your company uh, from a loyalty standpoint because they will say that, wow, you know, this is the place that really values quality. This is the place that really wants to build something good, and they're not, not like constantly. There's like five project managers walking around with a timeline and the charts on the on the wall, and all the stupid sticky notes and all the way around. And so we don't have all that stuff. Uh, you know, this is the place where you know we want to give you the space uh, to apply the creativity and build quality stuff. And we have the inner faith in us that if as long as we build a kick-ass product, a great product, we will make the money. We will be successful. Uh, I think a lot of people make that shortcut decision because you know they they lack that inner confidence and you know it's out of comes out of insecurity. Uh, the the second thing is that you know we always have you know a healthy dose of uh, paranoia and uh, I'm a big fan of Andy Grove and uh, you know only the fat might survive, which is that you know everything that you build you know we check like you know ten times because we're always never confident that you know what we are building is going to really hit it. So that, that sense of paranoia that also uh, instills, you know, some humility, you know, a lot of humility, uh, because a lot of mistakes that you do is out of more confidence that, you know, yeah, this thing's gonna work and we just uh, ship it out. So I think overall, um, a lot of lessons learned in terms of, you know, uh, making the right choices and the right decisions in the product development philosophy, in the market development philosophy, and in the execution philosophy of, uh, you know, building the right culture. And I think that's all um, kind of I've learned uh, a lot in the last four years. I've, a lot of these lessons were applied you know, in, the, in the previous companies. Um, and so, you know, this is some of the nuggets that really um, I've used in the, in the most <coughs> recent time. And that was a pretty, pretty good success. And I think even now, uh, as a part of the big company, it, it, this, uh, it, this, a lot of these philosophies are kind of not uh, have to give directly to the large company. Uh, but I think that's the reason why big companies like the small companies because of you know a very different set of philosophy and a very different style of execution uh, and the agility. So um, I you know I don't want to keep rattling uh, you know just the, the what uh, what has worked and what has not worked. Uh, but I think I'd love to I think make it more interactive and uh, let.
that you ask uh, you know uh, specific questions and uh, happy to uh, share the insights on that. Yeah, I think two Yeah, but you know, we were also very, when we grew into a large team, but we were very careful about growth. Um, I think there is a general uh, philosophy here when VCs put in the money and they are like expecting growth, 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 and the startup CEO goes crazy about hiring, 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 and like, you know, you'll put a recruiter in the office and hire like crazy, and the VCs are getting mad at you, why you're not hiring. Uh, we didn't get to all this pressure because we were very careful initially, the burn rate was very low. Because we knew that you know we don't want to jump on the, the revenue or we don't want to prematurely monetize our product. I don't want to get some half big stuff out of the door. So we kept the one rate low, and you know it, it does require a lot of uh, you know uh, philosophy uh, brainwashing with your board by saying that why you are not rushing into things, why you are going to spend more money, uh, and, and it's not easy uh, you know because it's really a philosophical and, and an ideological debate and. Uh, you, if you're lucky that you'll get a few VCs in the Valley who, who understands that concept, you know. Because they are all drinking the Kool-Aid of the other web to companies who are like, how fast they're growing and how fast they're launching and how fast they're iterating. So, a question from the audience. Uh, 